Hi, my name is Christine Carter. I am a pediatric nurse practitioner and lead clinician for school-based health centers with lifelong medical care. And I'm Naomi Shapiro. I'm also a pediatric nurse practitioner. Uh, I've practiced for many years at La Clinica de la Raza School-Based Health Centers, and I'm a professor emerita, a retired professor at UCSF in the School of Nursing. Next slide. And so in terms of our disclosures, we have no commercial disclosures. Um, I have been funded by the ACES Aware for two different provider engagement grants, one of which is a research and practice paper writing project to look at best practices for screening adolescents and uh, immigrant families in general uh, for ACES. And uh, I also was a trainer for the ACES Aware Virtual Collaborative for school-based health center Medi-Cal providers. And Christine participated also in that learning collaborative. And we also wanted to acknowledge slides from many other folks who are part of those learning collaboratives. Um, could we do the poll now? The poll is enabled. So everyone, please feel free to respond to the poll using the polls heading in the upper right hand sidebar. And I will go ahead and read out the responses as they come in. We'll give Great. people some time. And also wanted to, as you know well, we can't see you and we can't hear you. So uh, anything you can do to make your presence known to us, you know, saying hi, uh, saying what you'd like to get out of the talk, any questions you have along the way. Uh, we're happy to answer questions along the way as they come up. And we'll also leave time at the end for questions and answers. All right, so results are starting to come in for the poll question. I have completed the ACEs AWARE training and attestation. It's looking like so far we have 66% say no and 33% say yes. And slowly we're getting some responses to Pearl's ACEs screener is currently implemented in your clinic or practice. We have three votes for that. 66.7% say yes and 33.3% say no. Okay, well, let's go on. So this is what we're covering today, a, a bunch of topics. The screen's been up, so I think I'm gonna move to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we're on the same page about uh, the terms that we're using and what they mean. Um, so um, adverse childhood experiences really refers to uh, 10 different, it, it, broadly it refers to child maltreatment, child abuse, child neglect, and various things that happen within households. Um, uh, intimate partner violence, uh, parental drug use, uh, parental incarceration, things like that. Um, and uh, they, the specific, when we say 10 ACEs or specific ACEs come from a study by Felidi and Anda that started in Southern California, Kaiser asking adults about things that happened to them in their childhood and looking at their results uh, in adulthood. And we'll talk about that in a more in a minute. Social determinants of health are the social and material needs that we need for good health. Things like stable housing, utilities, food, freedom from racism, homophobia, and anti-immigrant discrimination, uh, uh, legal support when we need it, free from legal harassment. Uh, toxic stress uh, and trauma are often uh, kind of mixed up with each other, and they're, they have a lot of similarities in their effects on people, but they're somewhat different. And toxic stress is really severe and ongoing stress, such as extreme poverty, racism, abuse, or neglect. Um, without sufficient adult support that can harm children's developing brains and can lead to changes in how they respond to stress and damage to their immune system. And I wanted to say like the original definitions of toxic stress um, really were phrased in a way that seemed to blame the parent for not being there for the kid, but really parents are also being 
subjected to the same stresses that kids are often in communities and really parents can be overwhelmed um, and they're uh, you know also that the more adults and caretakers in kids life the better so um, I want to make sure when we talk about that we're really thinking about both the parents and the kids as a unit that needs support and not blaming the parent if we feel like the kid doesn't have enough support for toxic stress um, positive childhood experiences include parent-child attachment uh, positive parenting so parent parental warmth and responsiveness um, and uh, firmness and family health and positive relationships with friends in school and the community and the reason i'm bringing these up um, even though we don't screen for them in the pearl screener is that they're really important to mitigate um, the adverse stresses that kids uh, experience in their lives next slide so in terms of the impact of aces so really the impact what we know about the impact of ACEs is really from epidemiological studies, um, studies of huge populations. Um, and we're not exactly sure uh, all the steps between the adverse experiences in childhood and the, and the effects in adulthood. But we do know that, um, that folks with high numbers of adverse childhood experiences can die up to 20 years before other adults with similar kinds of uh, chronic conditions without with very few ACEs, that there's higher levels of lung disease, higher levels of suicide, higher levels of substance abuse, higher S, uh, um, levels of liver disease. Um, so many people feel that this is the single largest unaddressed public health threat facing the nation today. Now that was actually said before COVID, but I think in the long term, it still remains a huge public health uh, problem. Um, so next slide. Uh, we believe that preventing ACEs could prevent up to 21 million cases of adult depression, uh, up to 1.9 million cases of heart disease, and up to 2.5 million cases of overweight and obesity, um, which lead to many other problems. Um, so, uh, and these are estimates based on uh, the 2017 Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, which is really a, a, a a nationwide screen of adults and their uh, behaviors and their uh, mental health conditions and some of their childhood experiences. So again, we're not sure exactly what all the links are. Um, next slide. In terms of overall child health at 18, uh, one study followed children from birth to 18 years and ended up with 804 adolescents with complete data. Um, their ACEs scores were similar at, at, at adolescence to early childhood scores. Uh, three groups were analyzed. Uh, those who had ACEs only in early childhood, those who had them across childhood, new across childhood, uh, and those who had really limited ACEs. Um, and so we know for most children, ACEs exposure does diminish in older childhood and adolescents, um, which is why lots of folks who've started screening for ACEs started with the youngest age groups. Um, most common ACEs were neglect and caregiver depression. Uh, the chronic ACEs group had more health worries and more medical care at age 18. Those with early ACEs and limited ACEs had similar scores. So kids who maybe even had a lot of ACEs in early childhood, but then had a more stable uh, middle childhood and adolescence actually did better. Um, and no impact of ACEs on health self-report, whether kids reported that their health was good or bad or meaning. Um, next, I'm trying to, sorry, I'm trying to advance the slides myself. Next slide. Hi, so I'm going to talk about the three realms of ACEs. And again, ACEs are the adverse childhood and community experiences, and they can occur in three realms and cause toxic stress. The first one of the realms is the household, and we mainly mentioned such as physical or sexual abuse, there's bullying, divorce, and alcoholism or drug abuse. Another realm is the community, and this includes poor housing, quality, of um, lack of special capital and mobility and poor air and water quality. And thirdly, there's the environmental example. So in California, as we know, we have record heat and drought. Worldwide, we have our pandemic. And also locally, we have wildfires and smoke. Toxic stress from ACEs harms individuals, families, as well as their communities. Um, and ACEs reduces the ability to handle and respond to stressful events such as resiliency. 
it's important to know that the study that Naomi mentioned, 17,000 participants participated, with 64% having one of the 10 ACEs. And to notice that statistically, one type of ACE is no more damaging than the other. It's really important that we educate ACEs universally to all families to help prevent passing of ACEs to their children. Next slide. In the 1930s, as the country was recovering from the Great Depression, the federal government aimed to establish homeownership in cities that had suffered from mass foreclosures. The Homeowners Loan Corporation, or the HOLC, was created to refinance mortgages at a risk of default. The HOLC created maps of cities to identify which neighborhoods were good investments and which were bad by assigning a grade according to best or favorable and hazardous or detrimental influences on their neighborhood. The HOLC also included minority communities um, as detrimental or hazardous influences. As a result, low grades were colored red on maps, which is known as redlining, as you can see in this chart right here. Redline neighborhoods were designed, denied access to credit because the federal government refused to back mortgages or loans. And this policy helped disinvestment and actually increase poverty. In the East Bay, which this map is showing, um, there was something called known as white flight to the suburbs of Albany, Piedmont, and the Hills. To remain to stay, we're forced to rent and we're not able to access credit to buy a home or to invest in small businesses. And then lastly, I wanna make sure that systemic racism traps people on the lower income into unhealthier places, such as polluted areas or dirtier air. Next slide. This chart is showing um, some data from the KFF um, uh, survey that was conducted in July and August of this year. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that in the US and elsewhere, COVID-19 is impacting black and other ethnic minority groups the hardest with black and Latinos almost two times as likely to die from COVID-19. An estimated 119,000 children across the country have also lost a primary caregiver due to COVID associated death with one 140,000 children experiencing the death of a primary secondary caregiver, such as a grandparent or next of kin. In addition, potential access related barriers to vaccination are more commonly expressed by black and Latinos compared to whites. 34% of black parents and 40% of Latino parents were concerned that they could not get time off work to bring their child to get their COVID vaccine. In addition, 30% um, of Black families and 44% 40, of Latino families reported being concerned they might have to pay an out-of-pocket cost to get the vaccine for their child. Implicit biases can play a part in these inequities. For example, 4% of doctors are Black in the U.S. compared to 13% of the population. And we also must um, make note that there are studies that have shown that doctors can hold negative stereotypes of people of color without even realizing it, leading to unpleasant interactions, improper treatment, and distrust, which might be also a um, reason why these statistics are shown. Next slide. So um, let's talk about um, controversies. There's, you know, um, we really understand the impact of ACEs on children and adults and population health. Um, but the original ACEs screen was designed as a research tool and there've been a lot of controversies about screening for ACEs. And um, so we wanted to just mention them and we're happy to take discussion about them in the chat and talk about them. So there's, one, there's some concerns uh, that have been raised about disclosure driven services versus universal provision of services. You know, um, when you screen for ACEs, and we'll go into this in more depth uh, later on in the talk, um, kids are given a score, um, and that can score could be from zero to 10. And uh, there's actually differential coding in the chart, in the medical record, based on whether they have less than four ACEs or four or more ACEs. And so there's some concern that kids would be only given services if they had more ACEs, um, or that uh, they might be tracked more for child maltreatment if they disclose more ACEs, um, that uh, clients may feel, you know, uh, many folks have suffered traumas and we work with a high immigrant population and also a very diverse population in California. Um, and really many folks have disclosed, have suffered traumas and 
adverse experiences that they may or may not feel comfortable disclosing to their healthcare provider. And so there's a thought that people may feel they need to disclose uh, these traumas in order to receive services. Um, so, uh, and then there's been a lot of discussion, I think more recently in some presentations about the concern that disclosure might lead to the increased monitoring of poor families, sort of blaming families of color for um, the racism, the structural racism that has impacted them, or you know, blaming poor families for poverty um, versus supporting people with more adversity. Um, and then uh, the Pearl Screener, which we'll, we'll talk about, goes into adverse childhood experiences and then community adversity, uh, which I think is really great, but there isn't actually anything on the screen about positive childhood experiences and child family strengths. And, and people are kind of struggling to figure out how to ask about that. And then there's some critiques about that. So um, you have thoughts about any of those, you know, we'll be discussing them kind of throughout the talk, but I just wanted to acknowledge that we're aware of those. Um, and um, so feel free to comment. Um, approaches to screening in primary care, that's the next slide, please. Um, so the traditional approach is that we screen to discover problems that we can treat. And really screening, like from a public health point of view, is we're screening for early signs of illness so that we can prevent further illness. So, you know, we screen for anemia in young children so we can treat the anemia and, and really improve their brain development. We screen for asymptomatic tuberculosis so we can prevent people from developing symptomatic tuberculosis and prevent community spread. Um, we screen for developmental milestones because we know if kids are falling behind in their development, the earlier we catch that, the more we can kind of help them catch up. Um, so a, a lot of folks have said, well, okay, why are we screening for all of these adversities if we can't fix them? Um, so that would be sort of a traditional approach. A, a trauma-informed screening approach would be um, to use these screens, the ACE screening, as a way to open up a conversation with families about things that have gone on in their lives and ask them for what kinds of supports they already have and what kinds of supports they might need or want. Um, so uh, that approach would imply that we don't necessarily have to be able to fix everything, um, but opening up the conversation and partnering with families may be a way that healthcare providers can support them. Next slide. Um, so what is a trauma-informed approach? Um, so this is a great, uh, a great slide from Trauma Transformed um, that talks about being trauma reactive. Um, you know, we are fragmented, we um, don't feel safe. We, and, and I'm talking right now about healthcare providers and, and the healthcare institution. You know, we, we're, we're fear-driven, we have very strict, for example, we have very strict appointment times because if people are late, it's going to throw us into a mess. And so we can tend to be kind of punitive to people who are late without really reaching out and finding out what's going on in their lives. Um, uh, trauma informed would be that we kind of, we try to resist, for example, in that example of somebody being late to an appointment, we try to resist re-traumatizing somebody who may already be traumatized. We have no idea why they're late. Um, we recognize uh, sociocultural trauma. We realize the widespread impact of trauma on ourselves and on our clients. We recognize the effects and we respond by trying to shift the practices. A healing and organization really kind of speaks to some of what Sean Wright was talking about on the first day about healing-centered engagement. It really moves to really thinking about how, can, how are we treating ourselves in the school, in the school-based health center, in the healthcare set, setting, um, you know, and how are, can we, join with our patients in this good treatment? You know, are, are we reflective? Are we collaborative? Are we relationship-centered? Are we flexible and adaptable? And are we thinking about equity at every, at every uh, turn? Um, next slide, please. So this kind of movement is really kind of going from like looking at a patient thinking like, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with that behavior? Um, to what happened to you, and then really moving even further to like, what is right with you? What are your strengths? What are your powers of healing that we can help support? Next slide. So Christine, is this your, your slide? Am I? Okay. Um, 
So uh, as a framework for screening, it's really critical to implement ACEs screening in the context of tra a broader trauma-informed care. Um, screening and trauma-informed care might be more challenging in the time of COVID, and there may also be opportunities. And by that, I mean um, a lot of clinics shut down, a lot of schools shut down, a lot of school-based health centers shut down, and we all, a lot of us went to telehealth. Um, but for the, for the clinics that were gradually reopening bit by bit, they had to move at a slower pace because of social distancing protocols. And for some people who um, started implementing ACEs screening during that time when people came in for in-person visits, they actually had more time. So they actually had time to actually have that kind of reflective stance like, oh, okay, what's the screening like? How's it going? How's it working for us? Rather than being kind of full steam ahead with their, you know, their full, full schedule of patients. Um, the other thing about this framework is that there's really, uh, in the literature about ACEs and also in the trainings that have been available about ACEs, there's really very little research with adolescent populations and within school-based settings for um, what the best practices would be from the teen's point of view and from, and, and from the provider's point of view of people who have tried to implement this. So, um, with that spirit, we're going to move forward. We're going to talk to you about, um, Christine's about to talk to you about all of how ACEs screening was implemented um, at Elmhurst Middle School. And um, in depth, and you can ask a lot of questions and please you know, feel free to put in comments and questions along the way. And um, then we're going to talk about the uh, impact, how uh, particular populations might react to screening, what might be some special things to think about and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the research that I've been doing with uh, Claire Brindis and Sinera Salomon for over the last year, interviewing providers and also doing some focus groups with teens. So I'm turning it over. All right. So Lifelong Medical Care is a federally qualified health center or an FQHC serving over 35 years. And our mission is to provide high quality health and social services to underserved patients of all ages. Um, I want to let you know that most of our population is below the federally poverty level and predominantly Latino or African American. Amongst 23 locations, we are spread out on three counties, Alameda County, Contra Costa County, and Marin County. And four of these locations include school-based health centers, with the first school-based health center being Elmhurst, which opened in 2011. Elmhurst is a public school in East Oakland, um, deep East Oakland, and we serve six to eighth grade students. And this is some data from last year's enrollment. So we had about 716 students, a quarter of them were African-American, 68% Latino, 4% Asian, and 4% um, disclosed more than one ethnicity. It is also noticed that 90% of students are eligible for free or reduced price meals, with almost 40% of students being English learners, such as Spanish and Arabic being the most commonly uh, spoken. We started using the PEARLS de-identified screener in January of this year for all well child exams. Next slide. Here is a copy of the Pediatric ACEs and Related Life Events Screener, also known as PEARLS, which was developed by the Bay Area Research Consortium on Toxic Stress and Health, also known as the BARC. And there's three different types of screening tools. This one you see is the PEARLS Child Tool for Caregivers. There's also a PEARLS adolescent tool for caregivers and a PEARL adolescent self-report tool for adolescents. The ACE score refers to the total number of ACE categories experienced, not the severity or frequency of the category. ACE screening should be done in a probabilistic manner and not a deterministic manner, meaning the purpose of these ACE screenings is to start a conversation of how the clinic can support patients and families to build resilience. It is very important to note that there's significant diversity in types of adversity experienced in childhood, and the adversity is actually widespread. Next slide. This next one shows the PEARLS teen, and it's a self-reported one that is given to teens 12 to 19 years of age. Part one includes 10 questions that screen for history of abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. For example, one question asks, has a parent or caregiver ever insulted, humiliated, or put you down? Part two, which is on the right side, includes social determinants of health associated with risks and may be at risk for toxic stress. This includes community violence, food, and housing insecurity, 
bullying, discrimination, and caregiver illness or death. For example, one question asks, have you ever worried that you did not have enough food to eat or that the food would run out before you or your parent or caregiver could buy more? Next slide. There's two different versions. There's the identified and de-identified screener. And as I said, in our clinic, we use the de-identified screener. The reason being is we need to use trauma-enforced approach to avoid re-traumatization of those with previous cases. It is also important to provide care that is sensitive to racial, ethnic, cultural backgrounds, and gender identities. The de-identified pearls are less likely to elicit strong emotional reactions, either positive or negative. And it also provides universal access to behavioral health. By maintaining emotional safety, exercising empathy, and providing compassionate responses without eliciting specific details, it also empowers patients with stress regulation tips and promoting resilience and validating strengths. Next slide. So this is the pediatric clinical workflow that is available on the ACEs AWARE website. Um, pretty much you can see here, there's pre it's pretty concise. Uh, in our clinic, what we utilize is we do a chart review one to two days prior to the appointment to help identify which patients have had a pearl screener in the past year. Our medical assistant provides the de-identified pearl screener and information packet to the patient or caregiver. In addition, the medical assistant provides a brief, really brief explanation of the packet and reviews the attached forms in the packet and so that they can also answer any questions in the moment with the parent or caregiver. Once the screener is complete, the provider reviews and scores the screener while also assessing for toxic stress risk using the risk assessment algorithm that you'll see in a few slides later. Next slide. So again, as I said, um, we give a universal ACEs pa patient caregiver packet to all families during their child well exams if they're going to be doing the PEARL screener. The letter on the left is a welcome letter, letter and is the cover page of the three-page packet. It discusses why we're doing the screener with the option of not completing it at all or taking it home and returning it another day. So far, we have not had any families decline to complete the pearl screener. On the right-hand side, you can see a list of community resources um, that address food, housing, rent assistance, and safety, as well as mental health. These are constantly updated um, so that families know real time what is available to them. And our staff, health educator, or supervisors are also available to assist families with connecting with these services. Next slide. Understanding ACEs and parenting to prevent and heal ACEs are handouts that can be found on the pacesconnection.com website under parent handouts. They're available in English, Spanish, and Dari. And there's also another um, a handout you'll see in a couple slides that is based off a book by Donald Jackson Makazama. Although I have not read the book myself, I do appreciate the simplicity and cl clarity of these handouts in different formatting. Next slide. In addition to the welcome letter, community resource letter, and the handouts about ACEs on how to prevent them and how to combat them, there is an optional post screening feedback form. This feedback form was based off the lifelong William Jenkins Post Social Determinants of Health Screener Survey. It asks the comfortability of screening completion, as well as understanding why the screener is conducted. And the feedback form also includes a strength-based approach to parental resilience. This, in turn, builds self-confidence as parents or decision makers. You can see here that um, one of the questions asks, in spite of what's going on, what is going well for you and your family right now? Another question is, what are your dreams for you and your family? And lastly, what hobby do you and your family enjoy together? On the right-hand side is the Parenting to Prevent and Heal ACEs handout, and that's the one that's based off the book. It gives simple, concrete examples of how to build resilience and combat toxic stress. Next slide. So I did collect some of these uh, post-screening completion feedback forms because I was wanting, since this was something new that was implemented in our school-based health centers, I wanted to get a feel of what parents and caregivers felt about this screening tool, especially during COVID, especially during a really uh, pan serious pandemic. There's a lot of stresses and unknowns, and we don't we want to be sens sensitive and appropriate when we do these screeners. Interesting to note, out of the 86 feedback questionnaires I received, 
81% of the parents reported being very comfortable with the Pearl screener, while 90% stated they understood why they were doing the screener. A lot of, uh, I wanted to also include some quotes that some of the families included um, that I thought were very pertinent and actually we utilized them to validate resilience and positive protective factors in the visit. So one of the parents responded that in spite of what's going on, what's going well for you and your family, they said they learn to value themselves more or that they value their health and they are appreciative that no one caught COVID. A lot of parents actually did similar responses for what are their dreams for your child or family and had some sort of um, response that said they, that they study and be a professional in what they like. Hobbies that families disclosed were going to the park and making homemade meals at home like grilled meats. Next slide. So in addition to getting the scores, there's an ACE toxic stress risk assessment algorithm, and this pertains only to part one of the PERLS screener. Part two of the PERLS is not to be included in the ACE score, but the provider should always address social determinants of health with community or local resources, such as our list that we provide. Concrete supports and needs that the clinic pr provides are things like assisting with insurance enrollment forms, as well as transportation assistance to appointments. A score of zero or more should receive universal education about ACEs, toxic stress, and buffering factors. So this is for everyone. A score of one to three with or without associated health conditions such as depression, asthma, suicidality, or ADHD may be connected to support services or interventions. By assessing for protective factors, the provider can formulate a plan jointly with the family. Perfect protective factors are things like parental resilience, youth resilience, social connections, parenting or child development knowledge, concrete supports and needs, as well as social and emotional competence of children. We should always do open-ended questions such as, how do you handle stress or stressful situations? Or is there adults in your life that you trust or rely on? I wanna make sure that everybody knows we should never make assumptions and we should always validate strengths and protective factors. We should provide evidence-based suggestions and recommendations to regulate stress, but we should always get consent before linking to therapy and supportive services. Next slide. So the fun stuff, documentation and billing. Guidance can be found on the acesaware.org website under training and certification. The website on the slide also guides you to the attestation and certification needed for Medi-Cal reimbursement. Medical providers are eligible for $29 payments for ACE screenings, and this includes federally qualified health centers, rural health centers, cost-based reimbursement centers, and Indian health centers. Billing coding is based on the total ACE score from part one, and there's two different codes that you would connect to your ICD-10 code. So if your code was, if your score is four or more, it would be G9919 while G9920 is used for ACEs score zero to three. Documentation is important in order to be properly reimbursed. So it must include what screening tool is used, such as the PEARLS, that the screener was reviewed, results and in their interpretation, as well as what education was provided and any actions or interventions that were recommended. This screener can be done one time a year per clinician or managed health care plan. Next slide. I would like to talk about some another type of risk assessment screener um, that we do in the health school-based health centers. And the reason why is risk behaviors are a major cause of morbidity for youth aged 10 to 24 years, mostly from preventable causes. The American Medical Association and American Academy of Pediatrics recommends routine health risk behavior screening for all adolescent patients. Screenings that are integrated in schools help health promotion, access to care, and health maintenance. School-wide screenings provide the opportunity for all students to visit the clinic and to be introduced to the services offered. So at our Elmhurst site, we do mass screenings and we do them in group visits with peers, which make it less intimidating environment, it normalizes it, and also creates a safe space for the adolescents. Other avenues for population-based screenings could be done during sports exams, routine physical exams, or even family planning visits. Routine population-based screenings increase health promotion and access to care through early identification of risks and a connection to services. 
Whether it be in your school-based health center or your primary care clinic, there is a shared goal for optimal physical, social, and emotional well-being and academic success for all students. Next slide. So this is the other screener that we utilize for our mass um, so cycle social screens that we use in our school-based health centers. For the past five years, we have used the Rapid Assessment for Adolescent Preventive Services, and also known as RAPS. RAPS is a 21-question survey addressing risk behaviors or barriers such as diet, exercise, substance use, sexuality, unintentional injury, violence, depression, and self-harm. It's validated and standardized, and it's age-specific, and was developed by a fellow pediatric nurse practitioner, Jennifer Salerno. She also um, later started the organization Possibility for Change, which is why there's a website up on the screen where you can access this. RAPS is recognized by leading organizations such as Society of Adolescent Health and Medicine, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, as well as the National School-Based Health Alliance and Michigan Quality Improvement Consortium. It's teen-friendly. It can be completed on any internet device such as a tablet, smartphone, or laptop. And this actually helps improve teen engagement and welcomes more honest responses. There's also a public health version of the RAPS, which includes social determinants of health. And there's also different variations that include um, access to sexual health assessments, as well as uh, motivational interviewing techniques for providers. Next slide. Here's a sample screen of what the teen might see. On the left, you'll see the welcome page that students see when they're logged into the website. It discusses what RAPS is, confidentiality, and consent. It also offers the option to accept or decline the assessment. On the right-hand side, you can see some um, examples of the questions that are asked. The first one being about substance use, and the sex second one being about bullying or feeling unsafe or afraid. Again, I want to let you know this is quick and easy to do. It takes about five to seven minutes to complete. The results are available immediately in real time, which means no risks are left unassessed. Risks are prioritized based on category and are color coded. And an evidence-based approach health education that are age appropriate are given at the end of the assessment for the student to read. Providers, clinicians, or health educators can use these messages for health education and support. And there's also helpful links and contact numbers provided, such as anonymous hotlines for suicide, as well as um, LGBTQI plus um, resources as well. Next slide. So after you screen, what are the things you can offer? What are the possible interventions? For patients who show positive risks, there are many different possible interventions. Interventions are categorized as either tier one through tier three. Tier one is primary prevention and is available to all patients and families. The goal is to prevent harmful exposures. Tier one also includes health campaigns or health education. Sometimes brief health education can be done at the follow-up visit with the school-based health provider, such as including sleep hygiene, nutrition, fitness, or safety, such as using helmets when riding a bike or skateboard. Tier two is a secondary prevention, and its goal is to decrease accumulation of risk factors. Groups that are specific to topics such as grief or even a girl's empowerment are considered tier two. If the patient needs connection to services that are beyond those in the school-based health center, a cost referral is done. Cost is a coordination of services team that is similar to a case management team within the school. And examples of school support services include connection to the school food pantry, academic tutoring, and mentorship. And lastly, tier three is a tertiary prevention and its goal is to decrease severity, progression, or complications from toxic stress. Individual counseling is considered tier three. For mental health services, the school-based health, health center provider can do a warm handoff if the patient is in immediate need or even scheduling a follow-up appointment with the counselor. If a behavioral health clinician is not staffed at the school-based health center, which some sites may not have, then a cost referral for a therapy service can be done in which an outside organization would provide the services. It's important to note that integrated behavioral health clinicians should always be trained to teach coping skills and mindfulness, CBT, and self deregulation. Next slide. Lastly, I want to talk about self care tools. Um, using evidence based strategies for toxic stress regulation can help reduce stress and build resilience. 
Stress mitigation strategies have been shown to reduce stress hormones, reduce inflammation, and improve neuroplasticity, which can actually counteract toxic stress response and improve overall well-being. Healthy relationships, balanced nutrition, physical activity, high quality sleep, mindfulness, and access to nature are all strategies. Healthy relationships is not on here, but I do want to let you know that they can buffer stress and reduce or even eliminate the negative impact of ACEs. And ourselves as clinicians can be great examples of healthy relationships with the patient provider relationship. Exercise is associated with improved memory and attention to increase resilient factors. It, physical activity may also support healthy relationships, such as being on a sports team or being coached by a sports team. Even brief exercise may help release excess energy and regulate the strict threat response system. Regarding nutrition, we always want to make sure we're doing healthy tips and strategies that are evidence-based, but we should know that stress can increase or decrease your appetite as there is a bi-directional relationship between nutrition and stress. Maladaptive nutrition and coping strategies, such as eating high-fat foods or processed foods, can lead to increased risk of inflammation and infection. We have to be really appropriate in our strategies and make sure we're trauma-informed support to support healthy eating. And by doing this, we can identify healthy fats and high-energy foods such as yogurt, nuts, and fish, and advising to store them in easy, accessible places. Sleep disturbances are also common and um, in non-specific outcomes of childhood adversity. Disordered and reduced sleep is associated with heart disease, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, depression, and anxiety, and also an increased risk of infection. Sleep hygiene is the first line of intervention. For example, eliminating electronics, caffeine, alcohol, and exercise can also uh, so close to bed or creating a calm down routine by bathing before bed or drinking herbal teas are also tools. It's interesting to note that bedtime routines can also increase in sense of stability and predictability, which can support resilience and trauma healing. The next one I want to talk about is mindfulness. And in case those who don't know what mindfulness is, it's a non-judgmental moment-to-moment -moment awareness including involving attention, intention, and kindness. Mindfulness has been found to increase the ability to tolerate uncomfortable emotions, increase your empathy, and improve patient satisfaction and re reduce implicit bias. Example includes yoga, acupuncture, breathing techniques, and Tai Chi, and there are also apps online that are either free or low cost, such as Calm and Health Headspace. The final one I want to talk about for your self-care tool is access to nature. Nature can come in many forms, such as parks, local green spaces, playgrounds, or even having indoor plants in your office or home. Adding green spaces to low resource communities have been linked to decreased crime and violence, overall perception of safety, and increased social connect connectedness and decrease in the depressive symptoms. It is important to note that uh, social inequality to access due to historical and current racism within parks or redlining has also led to feelings of lack of safety by community of color. So we needed to put extra efforts and need to be implemented to support communities of color and feeling safe and welcome in nature. As a provider or clinician, you can actually prescribe um, a prescription for parks or outside time or even adventure, adventure place programs. Thank you. Christine, before we go on, there is actually a question. Um, if you could talk for a minute about how you use the population level data of the RAP screen. Oh, yes. With the schools. Yes. So um, for the RAPs, it's really great. It has uh, an ability to filter and um, evaluate DF identified data um, based on the risks or flagged risks that your school population um, reports. And what we do in our school-based health center is we utilize this data and we provide it back in a visually um, simple way to the school administration to show what self-disclosed issues the students are having. A lot of times we had as uh, a top one was the helmet. So kids not wearing a helmet when this is safety. So what we did is we campaigned and got free helmets to support um, students who want them. We also had an increase of anxiety, depression, and even um, bullying. So we created um, health education groups for all students to attend, or they can even do one-on-one -on -one counseling if they were feeling uncomfortable in a group environment. Um, a lot of this data we use yearly um, 
We like to track and see too is um, based off of age. You can do it by grade, sixth through eighth grade. It's, um, or you can even do it by um, gender if you prefer, or even by race if that's something you are choose to do. And it's, um, I do want to let you know it is a yearly subscription, but it's been usually it pays for it's it's a reimbursable um, cost for your screener, so it is sustainable to use. Sorry, let me turn on the light. Yes, any other questions regarding the wraps or the pearls? Okay, I'm going to move on, but but please, um, we can come back to this again. So um, just keep questions and comments coming. Uh, so uh, for so I wanted to talk about very issues for screening different populations, uh, and I wanted to start with youth and youth and foster and kinship care. So um, clinics have the opportunity to screen either the parent of the adolescent or the teen or both. And I have been, uh, as part of my work uh, with Claire and Samira, we've been, we've been interviewing providers and people make all kinds of different decisions. Um, so uh, the problem is if you're screening, if you decided you're primarily screening providers or I mean caretakers, um, often the caregiver of the youth who brings the youth into care if they're in foster care isn't actually their, isn't their parent. Uh, doesn't necessarily know a lot about them. Um, and uh, so deciding which caregiver to screen can be kind of tricky. Uh, screening by mandated reporters can be a barrier. Youth who are in foster care or in foster designated kinship care are, you know, have been through CPS reports in the system and may be very, very reluctant to say anything that could trigger another report and maybe prevent family reunification. Um, and then uh, often kids in foster care have really transient care, uh, even though there is a state law that says they should be in this, they should remain in their same school district. That doesn't always happen uh, when kids are in foster care. And so there's a lot of trust building that goes into working with kids in youth in foster and kinship care. The other thing is that by definition, if a child or adolescent is in foster care or kinship care, they have already suffered a number of ACEs. And so, you know, one question would be, what's the point of finding out how many there are at this point? Because, you know, we already know that they have ACEs and we already know that they may need extra supports. Um, and then, um, although ACEs screening has uh, been reported by many parents and the few teens who've been in research as acceptable, if kids, you know, if youth are screened over and over and over again, that also may be. Um, kind of trauma, trauma inducing. Um, and then there's the issue that foster care in itself could be a source of ACEs. So, uh, you know, there's some just questions about whether we should be using the Pearl screener or something else or, or opening up a more open ended conversation with youth and foster and kinship care. Next slide. Um, so, youth with a history of incarceration. Again, many of the similar issues, navigation of services and trust building, their care is often outside of school-based health centers. Again, multiple ACEs are almost a given. Um, the numbers are sort of lower in the research, but still a mean of 3.7 ACEs. Um, incarceration itself is a source of ACEs. Um, and youth may not necessarily feel comfortable talking about those. Uh, Internal resilience and school connectedness do moderate the relationship between ACE exposure and psychological distress. So I think any programs that exist, uh, such as restorative justice models that can reintegrate youth who have been incarcerated back into the school setting would be really helpful for their long-term health, in addition to the short-term school integration. And then recognizing the school to prison pipeline and uh, prevention strategies that these youth are really at high risk for being Re, um, re expelled, uh, re suspended, re and sent back to prison. So, thinking about active prevention strategies rather necessarily than screening. Um, next slide. So, uh, I 
most of my career, I've worked in settings with high proportion of immigrants and newcomer youth. Um, and uh, so we know there are a lot of confidentiality issues. Uh, interestingly, uh, most of the providers I interviewed who are screening for ACEs work in uh, settings that have a lot of immigrant youth and families. And so there's some confidentiality issues. Um, generally in school-based shelters, we do get to see teens by themselves, but in outside, outside clinics, uh, you know, sometimes with immigrant families, it's very difficult to separate the parent and the kid and confidential care is not something that parents are used to um, in their home country. There's um, a lot, so in this way, school-based health centers can be really an advantage. Uh, there's a lot of worries uh, that come up within very small immigrant communities that there's a lot of gossip um, and that can even get back to their home country. And um, uh, when you are working with interpreters, so you're interviewing a youth in a language you don't speak, um, or is that not a common language, uh, often they are reluctant to trust interpreters because the interpreter might be from their very small community and they may be afraid that the interpreter will report back to other people about what they're saying. Um, and then uh, may often minimize symptoms or prefer to describe them using somatic terms. So uh, particularly if youth are saying like, oh no, I'm not, you know, I'm not depressed, I'm not whatever, but you know, I can't sleep or my stomach hurts all the time or I have headaches all the time, that's sort of a, a tip off to explore some of those kind of trauma issues. Um, and then there is, I've been uh, particularly doing research with uh, newcomers from Central America, and we've really come up with um, a lot of beliefs from youth in different countries in Central America that uh, who've endured pervasive trauma and multi-generational trauma that talking about this makes it worse. And so, um, you know, sometimes screening over time can be helpful because over time youth may be more able to admit, but also maybe getting into the conversation in a different way may be helpful. Um, next slide. So I want to talk about a little bit about the pros and cons of using the Pearl Screener with immigrant families. Um, again, many, many of the folks that we talk to who work with immigrant families say that when they saw that families were really stressed and distressed, they would kind of assume that it was from the trauma they had suffered in their home countries or the trauma they had suffered in getting to the United States or being in immigration detention. But actually often it was due to their current difficulties navigating life in the US, having enough food, having shelter, getting the power on in their house. So, um, so in that way, the Pearl Screener, which includes social determinants of health was really helpful um, in highlighting kind of current problems and difficulties. Um, and that, uh, even when talking, even though I have talked about the fact that many youth feel like it's not really correct to disclose the traumas they've been through, they actually may be looking for opportunities to share their stories and get support. So they actually may appreciate the, the screeners. Um, the caution that we would say see about using the Pearl Screener is that, again, refugees and those who are applying for asylum have had to tell their stories multiple times. Um, and the screeners may not translate well by interpretation. Uh, and then with LGBTQ plus populations, uh, a survey of US and Canadian youth uh, in 2020 found that 43% had experienced four or more ACEs, and these were most commonly emotional abuse and neglect or living with a family member with mental illness. Um, and these were highest among pansexual, transgender, gender nonconforming, American Indian, Latinx, and rural youth in the survey. And they were um, lower among youth, but highly educated parents who live with a parent or were Canadian. Um, and this, you know, this survey was done, the, survey, the results were published in 2020. So the survey may have been done during the uh, four years of the Trump administration, which was a particularly difficult time for LGBTQ youth given a lot of the media messages and the kind of ass assaults on their rights to be safe at school. Um, so support services and resilience building are really important for this population, as with all kids. Um, and supportive school staff are crucial, especially for youth who are bullied at school. And one kind of interesting finding that's related to bullying at school is that um, schools with gay straight alliances, and actually it's a, they have a different, they have a more of a, a more 
I think it's a gender sexuality alliance is now the current term. It's a, it's a more expansive term. Um, but schools with these alliances tend to have lower rates of bullying and improved school climate for all students, not just for LGBTQ students. So um, there's a real value in supporting these particular uh, organizations and improving the school climate for everybody. And um, we wanted to also, I'm still checking for questions and comments. Um, just uh, even with it, I just even checking in with an emoji would be great. So we know how, how you're doing, you know, usually I like to read the room when I'm giving a talk and that's not really possible right now. Um, so children with special healthcare needs um, are more likely to have been abused or neglected. And they are also more likely to be suspended or expelled from school, even when their behaviors are a direct result of their chronic condition. And this is particularly true for children with special health care needs who are uh, Black and Latinx. Uh, a secondary analysis of the National Survey of Children's Health found that children with four or more ACEs are three times more likely to be children who have special health care needs than children with no ACEs. Um, and the association is strongest for emotional, behavioral, and developmental conditions. Uh, uh, children with Autism spectrum disorder and three plus ACEs are more likely to have unmet health care needs. Uh, and more severe autism spectrum disorder is associated with higher AIDS scores. And, you know, sometimes school based health centers can be really, um, really a haven for children who have and youth who have autism spectrum disorder and uh, are verbal or can communicate in some ways because um, it is often a safe place within the school. And so it may be, you know, you may be assuming that because of the, their diagnosis that they're actually getting a lot of healthcare needs met, and that may not be true. So that may be something, you know, important beyond the ACEs screening to think about with uh, youth with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, next slide. So implications for school-based health centers are that youth special health care needs may not be coming to school-based health centers formally, but may be frequent drop-ins. Um, I remember my, my very first year out of North Rochester School in 1996, I was working three days a week as a school nurse at Oakland Tech, and then like one day a week as a nurse practitioner in the like La Clinica's first um, operation of a school-based health center at Oakland Tech. And, um, and I'd see all these kids dropping in and out. And then one day as a school nurse, I was asked to go give a health ed talk in a classroom for children, um, you know, at that time, children with very uh, severe mental health uh, conditions, there was a special class for them. And so I walked into the class and I knew everybody in the class because they had been, I think a lot of times the teachers when they were kind of like getting ready to kind of explode or maybe not pay attention, the teachers said, just walk up to the health center and go get something, you know? So they would be dropping in and out of the health center for a snack or, or something else. And so, um, but I never really realized that um, they had, you know, I just thought, oh, they, you know, like the health center, they like to drop in. But I think, you know, we were maybe missing an opportunity to connect on more depth with those kids. Um, so uh, I just, I think it's important to, to be doing outreach if you have special ed classrooms or you have kids that you know have special needs, maybe connecting with school nurses about that. But I think, I think we can do a lot to support, uh, to support children who have a lot of different kinds of neuropsychiatric conditions. So um, going on, um, just looking for more, any more questions. Okay, um, brief conversations. So some questions are, what do you do with ACEs screening? And I actually just did a, we've been doing focus groups with teens and I just did a virtual focus group with teens uh, in Alameda County. Um, and a couple of them had actually been screened using the Pearl Screener. And according to their report, Nobody explained why the screener was happening and nobody said anything to them after they completed the screener except thank you. So I think what's really, you know, what I've learned about screening is that its value is in opening up the conversation. Um, and um, so that is really what, uh, if you don't open the conversation, then what's the point of doing the screening? So um, Gillespie is a pediatrician who wrote about what he, uh, would say to parents um, after they had completed ACEs screening for them and their kids, 
uh, would, you know, do any of the experiences you had in the past still bother you now? Of those experiences that no longer bother you, how did you get to the point that they don't bother you? So that speaks to resilience and strengths. Um, and then how for parents, how do you think these experiences affect your parenting now? So we've adapted them, uh, just as a suggestion, because we haven't tested it out. Of uh, Do any of these experiences still bother you? Of the experiences that don't bother you anymore, how did you get to that point? Um, and then how do you think these experiences affect your relationships with your family and friends now? So just some way of really beginning to open a conversation and partner with people. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, uh, about um, confidentiality and the Cures Act. So um, if we were in a room, I would say, how many of you know about the Cures Act and its impact on confidentiality? Um, so um, you're, feel free to say something in the chat or not, but I'm going to keep going. Um, as of April 5th, 2021, so the Cures Act, just to back up for a second, the Cures Act was passed actually way back in the Obama administration as a way of making sure that different electronic records could talk to each other and really primarily to help drive research. Um, so they really didn't think that much about confidentiality and they certainly like, I actually went through the whole act and I wrote an article about it. And like, there's almost no men mention of teenagers or confidentiality for teenagers in the act um, or the final rule. So, but the final rule governing the act didn't actually go into effect until April, 2021. Um, and so the, uh, Open notes gives, uh, so if you're an adult and you go to your own healthcare now, you, you probably know that you actually have access to your provider's notes and your electronic record and you have access to pretty much all of your tests and you know screening results, really sometimes before your provider knows them, um, which is pretty cool. But it also gives caregivers access to their children's records. Um, it also means that specialists and primary care providers and parents can see all the problem lists and the meds. So if there's like ACEs on the problem list, um, or for example, past child abuse is on the problem list, um, they could anybody who is taking care of that child, you know, has access to these open notes, can see all these problem lists and meds. And then uh, also possibly contraception and sexually transmitted infection treatment, even though they're supposed to be confidential in California. Um, and uh, possibly problems or diagnoses related to ACEs and child maltreatment. So Specific therapy notes can be hidden, and there's also protection for drug and alcohol treatment. Sorry, but, I can't help you with notes on Apple Watch. Oh, sorry, my 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 watch is talking to me. Um, so um, uh, so that means though that if you are a primary care provider, um, and you are um, you are seeing a kid and having a confidential discussion with them, when you write up your notes, you have to affirmatively click whatever protections exist in your notes so that those those conversations are not transmitted to parents. Um, and so um, let me, uh, why don't you go to the next slide. Um, so institutions can be fined for information blocking up to a lot, but, and there are no incentives for electronic medical records developers to help clinics with workarounds, which means that rich institutions you know, or richer institutions like UCSF or Stanford can really pressure the electronic records, um, usually some version of Epic, to um, give them robust platforms and a lot of uh, and, and a lot of ways to hide some of these notes or protect teens' confidentiality. But um, most of us who are in school-based health centers are connected to school, to public health or uh, federally qualified health centers, and we we have the basically low rent versions of electronic records, and it's very hard to get these protections built in. So, um, but you actually can block uh, anything that would bring potential harm to the patient that would harm legal proceedings, which means child maltreatment reports can be really um, covered, uh, can, be can be blocked, um, and anything that's not feasible. So if you can't segment out information that you don't have to give a my chart to a 14-year-old if you're worried about their parent finding this out. And that, um, Protecting privacy is, gathered, is guaranteed by state and federal laws. Just to let you know, uh, somebody at Stanford did a did a kind of a survey of their um, my chart kind of platforms uh, that adolescents could access by themselves, and they found out that in over 50% of the cases, the email address that was connected to the platform was the parent's email address. So I, I just think it's important to know. Um, so just. Um, 
so this is you know not the main topic but just to let you know um all right so there's actually some questions coming up let me just do the last slide last slides um let's go to aces on the problem list okay strategies for managing the cures act um so um decide whether you're blocking all the notes for teens 12 to 17 from release to my chart or check with your institution to see what happens with the after visit note because some are not giving it to teens because they're worried about confidentiality it's usually possible to block so if somebody comes in for a sports physical but they also tell you about their you know needing contraception or they're using marijuana um, and you don't want the parent to know uh, you can block portions of it but find out if that's possible because you usually have to be in advance check that you don't want it released and consider how or if the ACES score appears on the problem list. And also just uh, to know that uh, privacy protections exist under HIPAA for teenagers for confidential care, but they don't really exist under FERPA, which is the school-based um, kind of information blocking uh, and information control. All right, um, so um, there's a couple of questions. I'm gonna, why don't we break in with a couple, with a question. Um, so, uh, Christine, do you want to say how students seem to handle doing the wraps in the ACES screener? Is it okay or is it screening overloaded? Yeah, so the ACES screener is only done in our well child visits. And because we're a school based health center, although we are the primary care model, we aren't the primary care providers for most of the students. So we don't have, so we had about maybe 100 well child exams between January to now with our closing of the summer's time. So not everybody's doing an ACE screener. Um, the RAPS is universal. So that's the mass screener for all 800 of our students that we're currently doing now. And in, in, any, in a lot of times kids, if they've never done it before, they're curious to do it. Or if they've done it before, they're like, no big deal. I'm gonna do it again. Um, obviously it's their choice and it's optional. And we always do make sure they know what mandated reporting is, confidentiality, and that gives them a more of a safe space to then go ahead and do the screener. Um, but kids don't say, I've, I haven't heard so far that they are like, oh, this again, or I don't want to do this, or, you know, why is this happening? It's usually a positive feedback. And even one student who was a new student to our school this year, um, when I sat her down to the workstation to do the screener, I explained why we do it, um, why it's mass screening. So we don't pinpoint somebody, we offer it to everybody because you never know, people can be resilient in different ways and not be the classic, you know, um, troublemaker as a student, as an administration would label them as. And they understood that this is a, a very positive experience. It gives helpful information, helpful tips and builds on um, resilience as well. Thank you. Um, so just in terms of uh, the suggestions, this has come from the work that I've been doing with Claire Bridges and Samir Silamon Parm. We're in the middle of writing up practice papers, which will eventually be um, um, online and open access. Um, so uh, suggestions from the providers that we've been interviewing are to involve teams in the rollout of ACES screening. I know that some school-based health center systems, I'm going to give a shout out to Children's Oakland, uh, school-based health centers, uh, have involved teens in rolling out the screening and writing scripts for providers to explain the Pearl screener to other teens. So that's something you could think about at your school-based health center. Um, training the whole staff in trauma-informed care. And this comes from everybody that really, uh, that's really the one of the bases of what makes it successful is training everyone in trauma-informed care and really um, investing the time and investing the support. You know, and, and I think this is especially fraught right now because um, the COVID pandemic has been so hard on all of our healthcare providers and all of our, um, you know, both as healthcare providers and as people who have had COVID or as families have had COVID. So we really, we're really in a time where this is more important than ever. Uh, have a systematic plan, provide resources to all families, regardless of score, which is something that, you know, that Christine was talking about for lifelong. Um, ask about strengths and resilience. It seems to be really key. It's not on the screener, so whatever, um, and there isn't anything standard that I've been able to find. So I think people, you know, anything that really gets to what people's hopes and dreams are and what they're doing um, to kind of heal themselves is great. And really that it's opening a conversation. Um, and uh, 
so you know you can read the, the quote on the slide that that you know not expecting that you can solve everybody's problems but just being there to partner with them is really important and then the suggestions from teens on the last slide is um recommending de-identified so teens recommend de-identified screening they also recommending uh, exploring and supporting peer supports because a lot of teens like to go to their friends for support and maybe could get more supports from peers who are sort of organized and trained than from adults. Um, their recommendation for providers was to show genuine interest. They talked a lot about, um, you know, having to fill out other kinds of screeners and just feeling like the provider was hoping they were going to say no on everything because the provider like, seemed kind of uncomfortable going through it. So really kind of practice so that you are more comfortable asking and that you're really showing genuine interest in the teen and not just trying to check off the checklist. Um, and then going beyond um, the questionnaire to make a personal connection with youth. And as one said, as you know, letting the teens know that these resources are available at any moment for you and not just to jump on a call with CPS, because there's more to what's on the paper and what is on the paper can be taken out of context almost immediately. And just reiterating the fact that asking the patient what they want for that specific day. So um, we are done with our with we are done with our formal talk. Is there anything else? Any other screens? Let's see. We asked. Thank you, Jessica, for answering some of the questions on the chat. Um, that uh, the parole screener is free and the wraps does have a fee. Christine, do you want to say how much the, do you know how much the wraps costs? Yeah, so um, it is $500 a year per site. Um, so, it, and it's web-based, so it's, and it's HIPAA secure, and you can um, access it on any workstation that you can, but it's $500 a year and it's renewable. If you have other add-ons, such as like the sexual health, um, component. There's an additional sexual health component um, in addition to the sexual health questions that are asked in the RAPS. That's an additional fee. I'm not quite sure exactly, but um, you go to the RAPS website and they're really, really helpful in giving you quotes. They'll give you um, examples of the PDF version, samples of the questions as well. You can take a, uh, a preview view of the RAPS survey. So in case you want to see what it looks like on your end, um, it's really inner. I've used it for, like I said, five years. The system has changed a little bit here and there, but it's really easy to use. Um, and I, especially when you're doing mass screenings or having large volumes of screenings, it's really helpful. And there is a form of reimbursement. So uh, we have been using the 96160 assessment health risk assessment code for reimbursement. I know there's also a mental health reimbursement risk assessment code that you can utilize too. Uh, for the wraps, and just to let you know, wraps can be filled by me medical clinicians as well as behavioral health clinicians. And then the ACEs also uh, reimburses twenty nine dollars a year for each screening for per practice. So if a kid is screened in January and then moves to a different part of the state and is screened in March by a different practice, they can both bill for it. Um, and that's every year up until twenty one, and then it's once per lifetime per practice for adults. All right, I think we've come to the end of our time. I want to really thank you all so much for being here and listening. And thanks for the, the chat and putting in some, some feedback. It's great. And please fill out your evaluation form. Yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm dropping the evaluation in the chat. Um, take a minute and fill that out if you have time. And thank you to our wonderful presenters. That was really, that was a really great presentation. I think we all learned a lot. Um, and thank you for answering everyone's questions. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Have a good week.